Evangelical Free Church. I'd invite you to start coming into the sanctuary if you're not already in here. Um, welcome on this gorgeous and beautiful day. I'd ask you to rise and join us in worship. and right and would you greet them this morning Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you are thankful for what you encountered when you walked outside your door this morning? I just suddenly realized that I have not opened any of my spring wardrobe. So, I was like, long sleeves, I missed the memo. But uh, I'm so excited that you're here today, excited that we get a chance to worship together. If you're new with us, we want to welcome you to Elgin Evangelical Free Church and just tell you, it's our privilege to have you here. Uh, we have one hero in this place. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So we're so thankful that you'll spend the time with us. If you would like, there's a card in the seat in front of you. And you could fill that out if you would like and let us know about yourself. Or if you have a prayer request that you'd like to share, we would love to have you share it with us. Speaking of prayer, I want to invite my brother uh, Bob Thoreau to come up. He just has a short announcement. And it is about an important topic. Thank you, John. Yes, uh, Jesus said my house shall be called the house of prayer. May 2nd is the National Day of Prayer. We've had it here in our church in the past. This year, it's at the Vineyard Church, downtown Elgin, at 12 o'clock on May 2nd. Abraham Lincoln, who proclaimed this, said he would that all men would stop their daily work and come 
and humble ourselves before God and pray. So you're all invited. Mark your calendars. May 2nd, God's listening and God's waiting. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks, brother. We want to let you know that there are several opportunities for you to participate with us as a church. On Sunday mornings, we have an exciting thing that's happening. Uh, at 8.30, there is a class that you can attend, and it's called Everyday Leadership, and it's being led by Pastor Mike, and it's an awesome opportunity, and it's really to kind of discover and look at leadership from a scriptural perspective and how might God want to use you. We're all called to lead in a specific way, and this is a chance for you to explore that. So it's open to anyone who would like to attend. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to the ladies who attended uh, the Moody Women's Conference yesterday. We heard it was an excellent time, so we're praying to see what you're going to bring back and how God may use that in our church. I want to give you a heads up for something that's coming a few weeks down the road. Um, on May 5th, we are going to be having His Survey Sunday. How many of you don't love surveys? We hope to change your mind. Um, we are actually going to be taking uh, and doing this as a church. It will be part of the Sunday morning service, uh, and this is not going to be boring. It's actually something that we're quite excited about. His is an acronym, and it starts for your heart, your interests, and your spiritual gifts. And one of the things we want to be very intentional about as a church is to go, where are the hearts of our people? What is God stirring in you? Where do you believe that God would have us as a church get invested this is your heart it's what really of the things god's given you to be passionate about this is one or what are your interests things that go wow i'm very interested in this ministry and then what is your spiritual gifting so it's going to be a great morning it will be a unique sunday morning we'll be preaching on this topic but we want you to have it on your on your radar to come and be part of us some of you came and you thought we were doing communion this week we're actually pushing it until next week and we have lots of reasons for that uh, one of the fun ones is is that in the transition of our office pastor john forgot to order it i just want to own that in front of you all i'm the reason you're not being led into the presence of the lord this morning <laughs> so we will be having communion next week uh, right now, we have a really special opportunity. We have uh, missionaries with us this morning. The Cottos are with us, long-term partners with Elgin Evangelical Free. We're so excited. So I'm going to invite them and Jim Robinson to come up, and let's welcome them. Good morning. You see, we rehearsed this for a long time. <laughs> anyway, I, I just, it's my privilege to welcome back Mark and Kathy Cotto. I, we have a lot of new faces in the last few years, uh, but they were with us. When did you, a couple of years ago, I think, when you left? Two oh, thousand, what? No. Started in 2008. Yeah, when did you leave? <laughs> this is part of the interview process. Okay, so it's been a few years, like I said in the first. So uh, we just welcome them back. They're going to tell us about their ministries, and then uh, I think you'll be blessed by what, the, what you hear. Yeah. Well, we just want to thank you. Um, we have been blessed to be part of the Elgin E Free Church family since 2008 when I started as a youth pastor here. Um, and then, really, a privilege to be sent out as missionaries uh, with Reach Global, the international mission arm of the EFCA in 2013 and we just really want to thank all of you for your prayers and support. Good morning everyone. Um, I serve with Global Fingerprints, the child sponsorship ministry of the Evangelical Free Church of America. Global Fingerprints has um, the unique opportunity to equip the church to be transformational in the lives of the most vulnerable children around the world, opening doors to church planting, strengthening, and revitalizing churches. And 
We do that through child sponsorship. Um, for $39 a month, um, a person or family can sponsor a child and help to provide an education for them that they wouldn't otherwise receive, as well as better nutrition and medical care, and all through partnering with the local Christian church where the kids have an opportunity to hear the gospel and be discipled. Um, I serve as the Global Fingerprints Africa Division Leader, giving oversight to the ministry on the continent of Africa, and we have about 2,500 children sponsored in Liberia, Congo, and Zambia. I also serve as site coordinator for our Tabitha ministry in Congo. And the next four slides show um, some, of, some of our sponsored children, and our vision is that they would have a vital relationship with God, a strong character, and biblical worldview, that they would be developing life skills for relational, um, physical, and emotional health, and that they would be impacting their family, church, and community, and that they would be educated and able to sustain themselves when they're finished with the program. And one special young man that I'd like to just highlight this morning is Etabongo. And Etabongo is one of the children that Algeny Free has sponsored in the past, and he just graduated from the Alikia Center in in the northwestern region of Congo um, this past year. And Etabongo um, has been in the program for a while and he was suffering from epilepsy and he was able to go to the Promise Home, which is a transition home for children with special needs. And he received the love of Christ there and he also got help with, the, um, with his epilepsy by receiving medicine. And then he was able to go to a vocational training center, the Alikia Center, which means hope. And there he um, learned agriculture, and that now he has graduated from the program, and he has a large um, piece of land at home where he's able to be sustainable. And so um, we're really thankful for your, your partnership in ministry um, with us personally, and as we are serving in Global Fingerprints and Apex, and for your sponsorship of children like Etabongo. Um, it's really made a huge difference. And I have the privilege of serving uh, with APEX, which is the student mobilization arm of the Evangelical Free Church. Uh, APEX exists to serve the local church by mobilizing the next generation of gospel influencers to take the gospel from here to everywhere. We do that by partnering with Reach Global City teams around the world. This summer, we're actually partnering with nine different locations, um, and we're sending 25 students to those locations to serve on three and six week missions trips. The real goal is to see our students experience missions and really ask the question, is God calling me to serve overseas? Uh, Reach Global currently has about 580 missionaries around the world. Unfortunately, of those 580, within the next probably three or four years, about 80 of them are gonna retire. So what we are looking to do is challenge the next generation to step into those roles because we believe God is calling some of them to serve the Lord faithfully overseas. Our goal is to see 100 new missionaries, long and short term, by the end of 2025. We have a long way to go. We are at 25 right now. But God is moving, and we're seeing more and more students say yes to serving him overseas. So if you want to join us in praying for that, we would appreciate that. I just want to say thank you. Um, we can't do this work without your financial and prayer support. And we're so grateful um, that God has allowed us to serve him in this way and to be sent out by this church. All right, thanks, Mark and Kathy. Uh, I just want to give you something that has stuck in my mind for quite a few years when Mark was a youth leader and Kathy was serving in many ways throughout this church. Uh, I, I believe it was the, uh, the Sunday uh, when they announced to the congregation Mark was stepping back as the youth pastor. And it was so, the statement was, and pardon me if I butchered it, but Mark says, how can I teach our children to listen to God and hear God's calling when God's calling us to go back to Africa? 
and that's what they did there. And I just thought, I, again, that has been on my heart all these years, and how you guys just faithfully step out, and you know that was a huge step, right? You, how old were your kids at that time? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, they have a, a great story to tell. So. I'm going to pray for them. I'm also going to pray for the offering. So if I could have our ushers come forward, please. Lord, we bow before you today, and we're just so grateful for uh, the partnership we have with, with Mark and Kathy and Global Fingerprints and Apex and just, Lord, how they have just gone that extra step forward to follow what you have called them to do, Lord. And uh, I ask your continual blessing on them as they... Uh, they go forward in these different ministries. I pray for Kathy, who's taken a little sabbatical here this summer, and uh, just that would be a, a restful time for her, and just to uh, help her refocus on, on, on you and how you have called um, them both, actually their whole family. So Lord, I pray that you would continually bless them and keep them in your loving arms. Lord, as, uh, as the ushers are for, we are gonna, um, pass our offering baskets for and we uh, this morning we ask you um, again to bless and multiply our offerings and uh, Lord to just uh, keep on leading us as a church thank you for the mission focus we have here and how uh, it just can bleed into our everyday lives so Lord bless this time bless this offering in Jesus name Carries my 
Amen. Have you thought about the number of titles you have accumulated? Think of all the things that you have become or have been referenced to. Um, I think about my life and I have been Dad, that's a pretty awesome title. This is my fiance. I was super excited about that title. Um, this is Mr. Duncan. This is Pastor John. That's a pretty cool title. Um, I have recently graduated to a new one, which I'm pretty excited about, Grandpa. I did not know how I would feel about that. I'm digging it. But there's one that um, I'm looking forward to hearing again. I uh, probably won't hear it until I go to glory. It's my boy. I was thinking about growing up, my father never referred to me any other way that I can remember. And he would always say that to me. He'd say it in front of anybody. My boy. This is my boy. This is my son. This is my boy. I was just, I can't remember a time when he didn't call me that. Um, and I thought about how much that meant to me, that that's how he referenced me. And the reason was because somehow in that statement, there's more than, hey, you. <laughs> it's ownership. He owned me. And he was proud of me. And he celebrated me. He called me my boy. Um, I like calling my sons that. And of course, I have a, a girl too. You know, that's my girl. You know? There's something powerful about that parental kind of love and ownership. So yesterday, I went to a soccer tournament and my daughter was playing. And I cheated. You know, I wasn't... I wasn't being antisocial, but my car was so comfortable. And I pulled, and I literally, I'm like right up to the field, got a parking spot that was excellent. I'm just like, I'm just going to sit here with my air conditioning and everything and watch this game. And it was awesome. Um, about halftime, I, I moved over, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of closer to, the, to the, uh, my daughter's team, their bench. I have my window rolled down. And all of a sudden, Kendra's playing striker, there was this beautiful cross, and she's just in the perfect spot, and she scores the one and only goal of the game. <laughs> she's not going to forgive me for this. <laughs> but you need to know that in that moment, I lost my mind. <laughs> I'm in my car, and I literally, like, I'm up into the wheel. I'm like, let's go! 
and I'm freaking out, and yo, that's my girl! And, well, it's so loud out there, nobody can hear me. But then I turn, and I'm just to the left of me, there's this lady. I don't know her. And she's just looking at me, and she's like, <laughs> like, rein it in, Pops. You know, you've lost your mind. And I'm like, lady, you better be glad I'm contained in this car. We'd be fist bumping right now. Yeah! I was just, yes! I was so excited. And I was like, okay, calm it down. It's mine. None of you know exactly how that feels, do you? Of course you do. And something about the power of being owned by the one who loves you and made you. Uh, the passage we're in today is the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. And literally, this is one of the most powerful moments where you see the ownership of God, of His Son. So God the Father owns God the Son, and He does it all through the power of God the Spirit. We're not going to go into that portion too deeply today, but you need to know that this passage is one of the strongest testimonies and evidences of the Trinity. God is one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to reference that, but you'll see it all over the passage today. But there is something powerful, because at the end of this passage, Jesus will hear the voice of His Father say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And I'm going to just tell you right now, that somehow in that moment, church, is all the hope, for your Christianity. So, I want you to come with me. Three things we're going to look at today as we go through the Scriptures in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 down to 17. And the first one is that there is an identifying that will take place. And it's not just that we're identifying Jesus as the Son of God. It's actually Jesus who is identifying Himself and, and being made clear who He, <coughs> excuse me, who he is. <coughs> So there's an identifying. Uh, there's also an anointing that takes place here. I tell you, how many of you knew that Jesus got baptized by John the Baptist? How many of you thought deeply about why? It makes no sense. John's baptism was for repentance. Why is Jesus getting baptized? He has nothing to repent of. And you'll see, it's kind of confusing. But there is something powerful that is going to take place in the middle of this act, and we need to understand it. And then finally, you're going to see a declaration by God who says, this is my beloved Son. So I'm excited about this. Let's have another word of prayer. Father, just take this word, your word, and open our hearts. May we see the significance of what is going on in the baptism of our Savior in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and in the power of the love that is declared from you to Him. In your name, amen. So if you look at verses 13 and 14, I want you to see this identifying that goes on. And you need to know that right off the bat, this becomes a confusing moment for none other than John the Baptist. Uh, we read this in these verses. It says, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Uh, John is confused because he knows who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the sinless Savior. In fact, we don't have it recorded here in Matthew, but if you went over to John chapter 1, verse 29... You know, John had looks over, he sees Jesus coming, he recognized him, and do you remember this statement? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's just declared to a rather large crowd, this is Messiah, and this is the Savior, this is the sinless one. And then Jesus strolls into the water and asks to be baptized, and everybody there is there to be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. You see where we have a problem. John's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? In fact, it's powerful 
Because John is very aware, did you hear him call that out? That he needs salvation. He says, do you remember what he said earlier in this passage? You know, I baptize you with water, but there is one who's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Meaning that John is saying to everyone there, I can't save you. I can't forgive your sins. All I can do is get your heart ready to receive the one who can. The one who can give you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can come inside you and cleanse you and transform you. John is very aware that Jesus is coming, and in his mind, he's going to get baptized and receive the Holy Spirit so that he can be saved. But Jesus doesn't go that route. So John is very confused. I love Greek for some reasons, like when you read it in the Greek, it pops. Um, Don't think I just sit around and read Greek. I'm not that smart. But I know enough Greek to know that the pronouns in this passage are super, super emphatic. It's very clear. Literally, in just pronoun language, it would would be John saying, I need you. But you are coming to me. Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, exclamation point. Why are you coming to me to get baptized? I'm in desperate need of you. And so that's what brings us to the end of that verse where he says, and you come to me? It's John basically saying, why are you asking me to baptize you? Now just so you guys know this, when it says John tried to prevent him, that word means a long, sustained, athletic prevention. What does that mean? Jesus is trying to walk in the water, and John's like, no! No! I mean, I'm I'm being goofy, but that's exactly it. He's shoving him back. And thousands of people are watching John manhandle the Messiah. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. He's like, no, this makes no sense. This is not right. You are sinless. Why are you asking to be baptized by me? Any of you know the answer? Because i got a problem with this too. Did Jesus ever sin? What's He doing in the water? Now I love this. And I don't want you to miss this. Does anybody in here love Jesus Christ? I mean, you love Him. But how many of you have ever pulled a John? It should not happen this way. My Jesus doesn't do this. God, I know you're righteous, and if you were righteous, it would look different. I mean, Jesus is coming to save sinners, but he doesn't get in the muddy water with them. Come on, this can't happen. Does it remind you of anybody else in Scripture? How many of you know a guy named Peter? And when Jesus told him, hey, Messiah's got to go to the cross. He's going to be executed for the forgiveness of sin. What does Peter say? No, you're not. I would never let that happen. That's not going to be the case. Remember what Jesus said to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. i got to tell you, some of us think we know how Jesus Christ should operate. How many of you are glad He doesn't do it according to your schedule? And you need to be aware. And It's this way with me, with all of us. So many of you know your life and you know how it should look, at least according to you. And this is your posture with God right now. Don't. I will not let it happen. How dare you work in weakness? How dare you get into the muck and the mire of my sinful life? and identify yourself with me. Think about how often and how hard we struggle to let Jesus be in the same pool with us. And we forget that this is the inauguration of His entire ministry. This is the launch. Jesus is walking up out of total obscurity, 30 years old, 
He's never done anything to draw attention to himself, really, that we ever know about. And this is the moment he's going to kick off his ministry. And the very first thing he does is mess up the way it should be. Well, you have a confusion, and so then you have a conclusion. John's upset. He doesn't know what's going on. Look at verse 15. But Jesus, answering, said to him, Permit permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted it. The answer to why Jesus got baptized is he is there to fulfill all righteousness. All righteousness. Well, that puts us on a journey, and we're saying, how does Jesus getting baptized fulfill all righteousness? Well, when he says permit it, I love it. It means, you know, this act that does not seem appropriate to you is fitting. What does that mean? It absolutely fits this moment. How many of you know that Jesus thinks things fits in your life that you don't think fits? Any of you have any unfitting things happen to you this year? (laughs) Some of us are like, this is not fitting. This is not appropriate. Relationships don't do this. Jobs don't go this way. Sicknesses shouldn't happen like, it's not fitting. And Jesus says, this moment and what I'm doing is fitting. Why? Listen to this. Because Jesus came to identify with sinners. And I love that Jesus, on the very first moment of his inaugurated earthly ministry, does what blows our mind. How many of you are thankful for salvation? Salvation, you're thankful for that? How many of you struggle with Jesus being close to you? We desperately want a Savior. We want him to be all. but, But Jesus says, look, if I do not come and I do not become like you, There is no fulfillment of righteousness. There's no righteousness at all unless I fully identify with you. Just a couple scriptures if you're writing things down. Isaiah 53, 12. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Another one, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. One writer said it this way, He who had no sin took his place among those who had no righteousness. So when Jesus Christ is saying, it is fitting for me to be baptized, he's saying, it is fitting for me to identify with you. I am not in the water because I need to be there. I am in the water because you need me to be there. You guys with me? This is significant. Why? Because there's no way to fulfill all righteousness unless Jesus identifies with sinners. Uh, This passage is a place where so many great heresies have started. And most of them involve trying to separate Jesus the man from Jesus God. And a lot of the heresies are trying to make him so much a man. Some are trying to make him so much God, but they hate the idea of them mixing. And it's really uncomfortable. The Bible says that we get baptized, you know, to acknowledge that we were sinners and we've come to faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus get baptized to acknowledge that he is a human being. Fully man. Fully able to identify with you and me in every capacity and yet without sin. How many of you know we need that kind of a Savior? That's the truth. Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Friends, right here at the very outset of Jesus' ministry, He is fully in the water identifying with you and me. He's not confessing sin, but he's there as a representative. I think the other way that we understand Jesus fulfilling all righteousness is that baptism was a picture of how he was going to do it. How many you know that baptism is symbolic of what happens with us 
when we come into relationship with Jesus. We don't get baptized to be saved. We get baptized as an outward expression of what's happened. It's Galatians 2.20. You can imagine me with a person up here. It's about to go into the water. I have been crucified with Christ. I have gone into the death of Jesus. And it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. And I have come up in the power of His resurrected life. I no longer live. I, Jesus, I died with Him, and I rose with Him. He's paid my sin. And Jesus in front of everyone, can you imagine this? On day one, He tells us all exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be buried. And I'm going to raise again so that mankind can be redeemed. Amen? It's pretty good news. I love this. If you doubt it, Luke 12, 50, Jesus said, I have a baptism to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Friends, this is a beautiful picture because what's going on here is Jesus saying, I am fully identifying with you so much so that I am not saving you from a distance. How many of you know Jesus doesn't Venmo salvation? <laughs> he pays in person with full participation, bearing the weight of all our sin, experiencing the fullness of death, and raising again to everlasting life. Amen? That's what's happening. And here's the thing that you need to understand is that from the outset, you guys, Jesus is saying... I am the Lamb of God, a real Lamb, a real sacrifice that will really shed His blood for you. It will not be at a distance. It's some, not some kind of Gnostic spiritual thing that happened and Jesus wasn't really there. Just some imagine. No, Jesus says this is all real. Um, there is a very classic, and I say classic, illustration. You may have heard it. It's a true story. There was a professor on a Christian campus who was very concerned that the kids on his campus, many of them didn't even know Christ, and he wanted a way to make the gospel plain. So he went and found a guy in his class who was a great athlete. He asked him, a guy's name Steve, Steve, how many push-ups can you do? So he's like, I don't know. He goes, can you do 200? The guy's like, I think so. Golden. They come up with a plan, and on a, a day that next week, professor is actually was Christensen the professor walks into his his class and he's got like three or four boxes of donuts and he stands there he's got all these boxes of donuts and the kids are you know student how many college students donuts that would bless you literally they're like whoa we're getting donuts and so he goes to the first guy in the first row open box he says would you like a donut yes I would he goes oh hold on Steve would you do 10 push-ups so so and so can have a donut yes sir jumps down drops on the ground pumps out 10 push-ups. Here you go. The next is a gal. Would you like a donut? I think so. Steve, would you do 10? And he does it again. But the third person's like, no. <laughs> no, I'm not playing this game. I don't want a donut. Professor turns and says, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so so-and-so cannot have a donut? <laughs> not one person in the rest of the class said yes to having a donut after that. And every one of them, Steve got down on the ground and did 10 push-ups. By the middle of the class, there are full-blown debates going on. People are angry. One person shouting at the professor, I don't care about donuts. I don't care about Steve. I want nothing to do with this. Don't involve me at all. And the professor said, they're not your donuts. You don't get the right to offer them. That's mine. Steve. Would you do 10 push-ups so this person can say he doesn't want any part of this class, you or my donuts? About towards the end of this whole thing, it's starting to draw a crowd, and a couple of students walk in the room, and literally the entire classroom is like, no! Get out of here! And Steve's like suddenly sweat. He goes, no, come in. I can do this. And they come in. By the end of the class period, Steve had done almost 300 push-ups. And he collapses in this pile of just sweat and quivering muscle. 
And the professor came to the front of the room. And he said, Jesus Christ bore the weight of all of your sin that he might offer you salvation whether you receive it or you reject it. If that's the first time you've heard that story, I guarantee you'll never forget it. Heavy, isn't it? Jesus, from the outset of his ministry, stepped fully into humanity and walked our walk and carried our weight and our pain, whether we accept him or reject him. Amen? That's the truth. So what is going on in the baptism of Jesus? Why is he standing there at the beginning? He is identifying who he is. I am the Lamb of God, but I'm a real lamb, and I stand in the place of sinners. And if I'm not real and I don't stand in your place, there is no hope of salvation, friends. We need a real sacrifice. It's not the only thing that happens in this passage. Look at verse 16, and we see an anointing. You maybe not have heard that term when you think of the baptism of Jesus, but there is literally an anointing that goes on here. It says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. We won't go into it today, but there is strong evidence for baptism by immersion. Why? Because this is the model. But you need to know, if you got baptized as a declaration that you would put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's what baptism is for. But this is the strong picture of how Jesus, he's coming up out of the water from being immersed. So he comes up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting upon him. What is happening here? One of the things I cannot say with definition is what everybody in the place saw. I can just tell you what Scripture said happens. And what it said happened is that the veil that exists between us and heaven, the distance that you and I cannot see into the spiritual reality of heaven, was ripped open. How many of you hoped you could see it? Would that not have been awesome? Literally the sky unzips. <laughs> glory coming down, you know. It is an incredible, phenomenal moment. And what you're seeing is the approved Christ. I'm telling you, it's almost like from the outset of his ministry, God is letting us all know, almost like the angels, glory to God in the highest. This is the one I've sent. Here at the beginning of his ministry, heaven rips open as if to say, in case you didn't know who he was. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, this is heaven approving of Jesus. And literally it's the same terminology of the veil in the temple that ripped when Christ paid for the penalty of sin. And suddenly that distance between God and man was removed because Christ is now the mediator between us and we can be in God's presence because of His righteousness, just as that veil was ripped in half, this veil is opened up and what we see is the nearness of God the Father to God the Son and the nearness of Jesus to His Father. It's a powerful, powerful place. But something else happens here that, again, takes us into a realm where we're going, what is happening And that is, there is this moment where you see Christ empowered. And we kind of wonder what's happening because the Spirit of God descends like a dove. Now we know there's other doves in Scripture, but there's no other place where the Holy Spirit comes in any form or shape or has appeared as a dove. But suddenly this dove comes down out of the heavens from the veil And we're told this is the Holy Spirit of God. And when it says He lights upon Jesus, it means He rests upon Him and He does not depart. Now we got a question. If a person, you and I, does not have the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? We're not... Which means there's a sin issue. Sin is the reason we don't have the Holy Spirit yet. We haven't repented and turned to God. Does Jesus have a sin issue? So was he without the Spirit? Some of you are like, I hope not. I, you know, literally this moment you're going, what is happening here? Again, Jesus Christ 
incredible picture is showing us who he is and how he operates. Friends, how many of you know that when Jesus Christ came, you could read this in Philippians 2 and 3, the kenosis passage there, he set aside his glory. What does that mean? How many of you believe it when the Bible says, and Jesus grew and learned? Like, wait, he's God. How can he learn anything? No. You guys need to know, he was fully human. And he fully experienced humanity. And he fully experienced what it was to be dependent. And what is God saying when he anoints him? Two things are going on. God of heaven is proclaiming, this is Messiah. The whole evidence of anointing throughout Scripture is the Spirit rests upon them as God's chosen one. But the second thing is Jesus is saying that in His earthly ministry, everything He did, He did in dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this should theologically ping you awake because a lot of you act like Jesus is just, oh, He's the Son of God, He can do whatever He wants. Here's the whole wonder of Jesus and His humility. He never did whatever He wanted. He did what his father wanted. He did it in full obedience. He did it dependent on the Spirit. He constantly came to the Lord and said, Father, help me. Why does he pull aside to pray? Why does he bow his head before he performs miracles? What's going on? Dependence fully upon the Holy Spirit. By the way, Christians, how do we live now? Dependence fully upon the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is modeling everything that you and I who will come to faith in Him will experience. Amen? This is profound. So many people come to this morning and because they can't kind of figure out how this is going on, they they ask questions like, did Jesus become something more in this moment the Spirit came upon Him? Was there a reason He didn't have the Spirit? Like He lacked anything? There's a lot of heresies that have started here. The truth is, Jesus Christ was God in His divinity, but in His humanity, He would be dependent fully upon the Holy Spirit for power to operate. He laid aside His glory and experienced the fullness of His humanity and its need for power. How many of you know you desperately need the Holy Spirit? Can you let Jesus be a close enough identifier to know that He knows exactly what that feels like? He knows what it's like to be physically tired, to desperately lean into God. I'm telling you, some of us have taken Jesus and so removed Him from His identification with us that we don't understand what it is to have a great high priest who represents us so well. How many of you know that Jesus knows when you're tired? Because Jesus knows what it feels like to be tired. How many of you know that Jesus knows what it's like to feel sad and to have your heart broken? And in that moment, to not be able to pick yourself off the floor because the the loss is so great. How many of you know that when Jesus wept over Lazarus, he wept? He knew he was going to raise him to life. Anybody in here wept this year? We have this incredible Jesus, and in this moment... God comes down and literally anoints him with the power of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus will function in the power of the Holy Spirit throughout his whole ministry. Jesus doesn't get the Holy Spirit because somehow he became more righteous. There was no sin to repent of. He was modeling perfect, submissive dependence upon God. And if you ever wonder why God loves him, Try to wrap your head around being the one who spoke the universe into creation, but not doing according to what you want to do. And instead turning in every moment saying, Father, your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. You are worthy of all the glory and the power and the dominion, and yet you sit there and sweat and toil and feel pain and deal with lousy, stinking sinners who don't love you, and you don't repent ever in one moment. You never take back your own glory, and in every moment, even though you're God, you turn and say, oh God, your spirit, God, your will, in your power, in your strength, I obey. You guys with me? That's pretty profound. Well, all of that leads us to this moment then of declaration. Look at um, 
verse 17. I love this. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Oh, i got to tell you, when I study this stuff, I'm like, I would love to have heard that. You know, you read the book of Ezekiel, and it says of God, it says, And behold, the glory and the brilliance of God of Israel, and coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. You imagine that moment? The dove has come down, it sits upon him, and suddenly the voice of God comes through from heaven and speaks. We hear the declaration of God. And what you hear here is amazing because it's just the pure delight of the Father. That's what he calls Jesus. This is my beloved Son. I wrote it this way in my notes. This is the one whom I love above all else. This is the one whom I share a love with beyond comprehension. It is eternal, righteous, glorious, pure, holy, perfect. Do you know that God planned the universe around these moments? Do you know that everything that is, is because of His Son? The reason you exist, if anybody ever asks you why do you exist, it's not because you're some you know, evolutionary soup. You exist because God loves His boy. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. This is the whole point, is that God loves His Son, and He loves His Son because His Son is the one who redeems all of His creation and buys it all back and His Son's obedience and His glory and His all of it. This is a love that was beyond our notion of existence and anything ever existing. This love existed. It is the greatest place of peace and joy and perfection and truth and meaning and delight and, and it exists between God the Father and God the Son. And in this moment, I almost get this picture of a dad, you know, who's not supposed to do this, running out of the delivery room with his boy in his hands and saying, it's my son! This is him! This is who you've been waiting for! This is the one! This is everything! This is my boy! You okay if I get a little loud? I'm not trying to be. Literally, this is my son. My beloved son. And then he says this, in whom I am well pleased. Do you know why God is well pleased with Jesus? You could say a million things here, but I will tell you the primary reason God loves his son, and it's this, because his son does his will. John 10, 17, Jesus said, For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. You know why God delights in His Son? You can almost hear the Father saying, what He's doing is in front of all these people, He's anointing His Son and calling out, this is my beloved Son, this is the Messiah. And you can almost hear these words, here is my boy who left his throne out of love for me and a desire for my glory. And he set it all aside. He has lived in obscurity for 30 years in the limitation of humanity in perfect obedience without complaint. He has done everything I have asked of Him. And here He is in full obedience, identifying Himself before you today as the one who will give His life because He loves me, that you might be with me. This is my beloved Son. And so when He says He's well pleased, you guys, 
you know what the word is? It's, it's one of those cheesy old, it's delight. This is my delight. I got to tell you, um, if you know my wife, Kim, she's got a great laugh. You're going to get me in trouble, but and she's got a great smile. And I, I love it because she's working up at school and even the students know about it. Have you laughed with Miss Kim? I had that conversation. It was great. And, and what I love about Kim is that when she, her joy is just fully, but I gotta say, I've, I've, for almost 30 years, that's been my experience of just enjoying that part of her and everything. But I gotta tell you, there's a new gear I've never known. And it's when she FaceTimes our grandson, Robbie. And there's a something that happens in that moment that is so joyous and so sweet. And the laughter and the satisfaction and the, the sweetness, it penetrates everything. And, it just, and she just gets consumed in that moment and the smile. It's delight. Now you need to know, God the Father says to you and I today, this one is my delight. He is the fullness of my happiness and my joy who lives to do my will. Now, where and why have I taken you on this journey? Because you need to understand this connection point if you're here today. This is where hope is. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then salvation means not just that your sins are forgiven, it means that you are now in Christ. That means that you now, your life is found in Him. Been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. Meaning what? Meaning that that thing you've been chasing your whole life, that elusive something that makes sense out of everything, Somehow you were created to experience it, but you've been separated because of your sin and it's been lost. And it's that place where there is perfect peace and perfect joy and perfect satisfaction and perfect affirmation and perfect confidence. And what could possibly do with that? It must be the love of God. And I'm telling you, before God so loved the world, God so loved His boy. Therefore, the world came into existence so that His Son could be glorified to the glory and the wonder of the Father. Meaning that suddenly to be a Christian means I am in the path of the love of God the Father for His Son. It's me! What in the world? It's you! Every one of you. If you know Christ, just swim in this just for a second. That it means you are now a recipient of the proud Father of heaven who can look at your life and say, I am well pleased. I delight in you. For the sake of my son. Amen? All right. I'm a little late. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here and I'm going to finish this sermon. I've told you this story before. I have never forgotten it. I preached one of my first sermons in a place called Grace Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, a rather large church, big auditorium. I said amen, and a very, very large man stood up. And he was bawling. And I knew he was big, but by the time he got on stage, it was terrifying. <laughs> I mean, he was just dwarfed me. Huge guy. And he never stopped. And I'm like, hi, I'm Pastor. And he picks me off the ground. And he sticks his cheek that is wet with tears into my face. And I hear these words. 
your dad led me to Jesus. Your dad led me to Christ. For the next three years, Mark loved me. Gave us his house for college ministry. That's love. Over and over again, poured out his love for me. But it was because he loved my dad. Friends, we are recipients of the love of the Father for the Son. And all the benefits of salvation are ours because of Him. Amen? Amen. Then let's stand and let's worship Him. takes away the sins of the world.
I just imagine God the Father saying it. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is my beloved Son. How many of you are thankful for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, today? <laughs> Amen. Amen. As you go this morning, just know that uh, we live in the love of a Father for His Son, a Son who identifies Himself with you and me in all of our weakness and dies in our place and rises again. And we can't lose that love because He can't lose that love. Amen? So, as you go today, keep that in mind. I want to remind you, Mark and Kathy are out there. They have a table. If you are interested in getting on their prayer list or ministry, we'd love for you to do that. Uh, make sure you shake hands, and if you get aggressive, hug someone uh, and let them know you're glad they're here. You are dismissed. God bless you.